Well, hello and welcome to the Spirit Filled Life channel. Today, I want to share a paper that I've written on total inability of the will and how that relates to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. And I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to use my paper as sort of study notes for this video. I don't have all this uh, memorized. I wish that I did, but uh, anyway, moving right in. So today I want to talk about a fourth century church doctrine that was really articulated and gained momentum during the time of the Great Reformation, but has grown in popularity over the past couple decades. It is a subcategory of Reformed theology, or Calvinism, as many of you may have heard of before, known as total depravity, and it speaks to the fallen, sinful condition of man from birth. As a former Calvinist of 18 years, I still affirm the depravity of man, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But what I want to discuss today is the traditional Calvinist understanding of total depravity, that man is not only dead in trespasses and sins, but also born with a moral incapacity to respond positively, even to God's own appeals in Scripture to be reconciled from that fallen condition, as Dr. Leighton Flowers so eloquently puts it. I believe this view of total depravity is the very foundation of Calvinism. We can see this from the acronym TULIP. Total depravity, i.e. a total inability of the will on Calvinism, is the reason that election must be unconditional. After all, how can it be conditioned upon one believing in Christ if they are born morally incapable of believing spiritual truth? The atonement is therefore limited to those who must be unconditionally elected because of their moral inability, and thus God's grace is truly irresistible to those elect. I would often use the analogy of a newborn baby being unable to resist the urge to breathe after being born. Just as breathing is a natural result of being physically alive, so believing is a natural result of being spiritually alive. And so in that way, grace is irresistible on Calvinism. Finally, if we have no role to play in salvation, i.e. free will, then we have no role to play in losing our salvation, bringing us to the final point, perseverance of the saints. This is why I believe that Calvinism is built upon the idea that man is morally incapable of responding to God's life-giving truth. And this is what I want to gently push back on, starting with Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. If total inability of the will is the foundation of Calvinism, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 is no doubt one of the scriptural footings that Calvinists used as a proof text to support that foundation. If anyone ever asked me as a Calvinist to give scriptural evidence supporting the idea of moral inability, this was one of the verses I would turn to. And so this is the passage we'll be dealing with today. And to any of my Calvinist brothers and sisters who may be reading this, I want to say a special thank you for taking time to consider another perspective. It's something that I wasn't willing to do for a large portion of my life, especially especially as a uh, my time as a Calvinist. So I want to say thank you for taking the time to watch this video. So, let's take a look at Romans chapter 3 and see uh, why it's traditionally been used to support this idea of moral inability. Romans chapter 3. What then? Are we better, better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. As a former Calvinist, I would read this passage and think, if God were to peer through the expanse of time looking for someone who seeks after him, this verse proves he would find no one. Therefore, God must necessarily cause the seeker to seek after him. I would often use the analogy of the Titanic disaster. In the movie, when those in the lifeboat returned to look for survivors in the freezing waters, they didn't find anyone who understood the condition they were in or seeking to be rescued. Instead, they found everyone frozen dead in the water. There was no one understanding, no one seeking to be saved. And that's what I understood this passage to be saying. God is in the lifeboat looking for those who understand and seek after him, but he doesn't find anyone. And so on Calvinism, the only ones who are saved by God are the ones whom he first resurrects to new life through an effectual work of the Holy Spirit, i.e. regeneration, pulling them alive into the lifeboat. 
If he were to simply pass over them, they would remain completely frozen and dead in their trespasses and sins, morally incapable of responding to God's appeals to be rescued. But is this really what was in the mind of Paul when he was writing his letter to the church in Rome? Consider the very next verse. They have all turned aside. Together they have become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 12. Now, if Paul is indeed speaking to the moral inability of mankind to respond positively, even to God's own appeals to be reconciled, when he says there is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks after God, why is it that these very same people are said to have turned aside and become unprofitable in the very next verse? How can someone turn aside from a God who sovereignly decreed before the foundation of the world to be born with a moral incapacity of turning towards him in the first place? In other words, what are they turning away from? God? Surely not on Calvinism. And how is it that someone can become unprofitable if they are born morally incapable of being spiritually profitable? The reprobate are born turned aside and unprofitable on Calvinism. So how can they turn aside from God and become unprofitable? This verse doesn't make rational sense as far as I can tell if we interpret Paul this way. I believe the obvious conclusion we should draw from this is that Paul is not speaking of a reprobate people. He's speaking of a people that at one time knew God, but then turned aside, who at one time were profitable but became unprofitable. Think of it this way. Can someone born without eyes or ears become blind and deaf? Of course not. They were born with a physical inability to see or hear. So who is Paul speaking of here if not the reprobate? First, we need to understand that Paul is actually quoting from Psalms 14. So if we want to discover what people he is referring to in Romans chapter 3, then we need to answer the question. Who are the people in Psalm 14? That's what Paul is teaching from. Remember the question he raised. Are we, the Jews, better than they, the Greeks? Not at all. Then he quotes from Psalm 14 to answer the question. So let's take a closer look at this passage and discover who Paul is referring to. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call on the Lord? There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Here, David is speaking of a prophecy that was first mentioned in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you. And gather you from among all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. The Lord promised to bless his people in the land he gave them if they would be faithful to him alone and serve no other gods. He also promised to curse them and drive them out of the land if they turned away from him to serve other gods. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse the blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I have commanded you today and go after other, and go after other gods which you have not known. Deuteronomy chapter 11. 
And this is exactly what they did. They turned aside from Yahweh to serve other gods, even sacrificing their own children in the fire to Baal. Because the people have forsaken me and have profaned this place by making offerings in it to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known, and because they have filled this, this place with the blood of innocents and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come into my mind. That's Jeremiah chapter 32. This happened at a time in history when the nation of Israel had become split into two kingdoms because of the disobedience of King Solomon. The northern kingdom, or house of Israel, were the first to serve other gods. The Lord drove them out of the land by means of the Assyrian captivity in 721 BC, never to return again. Physically, that is. The southern kingdom, or house of Judah, also called house of Jacob, were the Jews. They began serving other gods, other gods as well as Israel did, and the Lord drove them out of the land by means of the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. Jeremiah 3, 8. For the, shepherd, for the shepherds have become dull-hearted. They have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the report has come, and a great commotion out of the north country, to make the cities of Judah desolate. A den of jackals. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. O Lord, correct me, but with justice, not in anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Pour out your fury on the Gentiles who do not know you, and on the families who do not call on your name. For they have eaten up Jacob, devoured him, and consumed him, and made his dwelling place desolate. Jeremiah chapter 10. Notice the rhetoric here in Jeremiah 10.25. For they have eaten up Jacob, devoured him, and consumed him is the same as in Psalm 14, who eat up my people as they eat bread. Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. This is because Jeremiah and David are both speaking of the same Babylonian captivity. In Psalm 14, David is looking forward to a time when both the southern house of Jacob the Jews, and the northern house of Israel, the scattered northern kingdom, now one Gentile people, are brought back from their captivity and saved. A salvation that comes out of Zion, Jerusalem, i.e. Jesus Christ. Now, unlike the northern house of Israel, the Lord had mercy on Judah, and their captivity would last only 70 years to preserve the lineage of the Messiah so that the prophecy in Deuteronomy that David is referring to could be fulfilled. So what is Paul's point in bringing all this up? I believe the answer is found in the preceding verses. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Now, what does Paul mean when he says that both Jews and Greeks are under sin? And what does being under sin have to do with the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities that Paul is pointing to in Psalm 14? Understand that Paul is speaking to his Jewish readers here. He says, are we, meaning the Jews, better than they, the Greeks? I believe what he is trying to communicate here is the fact that anyone who turns aside from Yahweh, Jew or Greek, if you turn aside from his covenant, i.e. the new covenant that Jesus came to establish by his blood, then you are under the authority or dominion of sin to condemn you through the law for breaking his covenant. For sin shall have no dominion over you, new covenant believers, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. The Jews rejected Christ. They rejected the new covenant that the prophets had spoken of. And as their fathers before them in Babylon, 
were subject to the same curse and the same promise to be driven out of their land if they turn aside from Yahweh to serve other gods. And this is exactly what happened. The Jews were again cursed and driven out of their land in 70 AD for rejecting their Messiah, i.e. the New Covenant. This is also prophesied in Deuteronomy 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. This is the Lord speaking to Moses. And will put my words in his mouth, speaking of Christ. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. This prophecy is speaking of Jesus. He is the prophet like Moses. And we find confirmation of this in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him, Jesus, you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So in closing, let's walk through Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 one more time and try and understand it in its original first century context. What then? Are we, the Jews, better than they, the Greeks? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin i.e. we are all under the authority of sin to condemn us if we are not in covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father. As it is written, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. There is none righteous. No, not one. In other words, there is no one righteous by works of the law not even the most prestigious rabbis of Paul's day. Our only hope is to be in covenant with our Heavenly Father, who is full of mercy and compassion, patience, goodness, and faithfulness, who credits righteousness by faith and keeps no record of wrongs for those who have faith in Christ. I believe Paul is trying to reason with his Jewish peers here. Unlike their fathers in Babylon, whom God chose to have mercy on in order to preserve the lineage of the Messiah, the Jews in Paul's day were no longer in covenant with God. Faith in Christ is the only way to enter into the new covenant, and so they were no better than the Gentiles at that point. Both they and the Gentile people were both out of covenant with God apart from Christ. Paul's solution, of course, is for both Jews and Greeks to enter into a new covenant with God through faith in Jesus. And we can read about this new covenant in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then none would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I believe the point Paul is making in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 is not to say that all people for all time are born with a moral incapacity to see, hear, or perceive spiritual truth, but instead to say that all people, both Jews and Greeks, are under the curse of sin and in need of a Savior. Being a physical descendant of Abraham does not save you. Being dedicated to keeping the law does not save you. Only faith in Christ and His finished work on the cross can bring someone into a right relationship with our Heavenly Father.